What if I told you that, hidden in the depths of the oceans, there are deposits of rare and precious metals, larger than anything we have on land? In 1872, a ship called HMS Challenger set sail from the United Kingdom with the goal of circumnavigating the planet Earth. The expedition, which for many marks the beginning of modern oceanography, completed its mission in 1876. It is even difficult to choose which was the most important discovery of an expedition that contributed so much to our knowledge of the oceans. It was during this expedition that we discovered it is much deeper than we imagined. It was this expedition that discovered the Challenger Deep, the deepest known point, and the place was named in honor of the ship. More than 4,700 species of marine life were discovered, and they came so close to Antarctica that they probably made the first photographic records of icebergs that we know of. But among so many achievements of incredible discoveries, one stands out, which begins, the whole story that leads to the reason for the video you are watching to exist. Hey, Pedro here. This video you are watching was originally in Portuguese, my native language. This is the attempt of our team to translate it to English, and I sincerely hope you enjoy it. Your feedback is extremely important to us. Now, back to the video. On February 18, 1873, not long after setting sail from Tenerife, the crew of the Challenger recovered from the seabed something that looked like a rock, not very large, with a dark appearance. A few weeks later, on March 7, another very similar one was recovered from the seabed in a different location. What the two had in common was an unexpected concentration of manganese and iron oxide, reaching 30%. By the end of the expedition in 1876, the crew of the HMS Challenger recovered more and more of these formations from around the world's oceans. And today we know them as polymetallic nodules, or manganese nodules, depending on the concentration. There are places in the ocean where you couldn't step on the sand without touching one of these. They practically cover the entire seafloor. And what makes them so special and economically interesting is that, besides manganese and iron, these polymetallic nodules also contain other valuable metals, such as nickel, copper, and cobalt, as well as traces of lithium and rare earth metals. Nickel, cobalt, and lithium are particularly interesting because they make up batteries, which power the modern technological world. And currently, practically the entire production chain depends on the extraction of these metals, which often, as in the case of cobalt, occurs in problematic ways in countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But even though they are found in oceans all over the world, there are some regions that have unusually high concentrations of nodules, such as the clarion clipperton zone, which is located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There is so much manganese in this region that it alone has a reserve larger than those found anywhere else. The same is true for nickel and cobalt. In the clarion clipperton zone alone, it is estimated that there is two to three times the amount of cobalt and nickel available compared to land-based reserves, and this is just one of several identified zones with high concentrations of nodules. There is another in the west of South America, one in the Indian Ocean, and another in the Cook Islands. If you already feel satisfied, we have barely begun our exploration of the hidden riches at the bottom of the sea. If we could go back in time to 1979, perhaps we could be part of a historical discovery. In a portion of the ocean near the Galapagos, a team of researchers was about to descend to the ocean floor in a submarine called Alvin. Waiting for them was a series of structures that became known as hydrothermal vents. These fissures constantly emit a kind of smoke or fumarole in technical terms, which consists of superheated water with dissolved minerals. They form when ocean water penetrates the Earth's crust and is heated, including by magma. The water, now rich in metals such as copper, zinc, and even gold and silver, is brought back to the seafloor, where these structures that resemble towers are formed. But be careful not to get too close, because the water coming out of them is about 350 degrees Celsius. The places with the highest concentrations of hydrothermal vents are regions of tectonic activity, usually where two plates meet. The environment around hydrothermal vents is so reactive and so rich in energy and elements that we suspect life on Earth itself may have originated in these extreme environments. But in the context of this video, they are especially interesting because their structure is formed by these valuable metals through what are called metallic sulfides, which are rich in copper, zinc, lead, and even gold and silver. Moreover, only a small portion of these metals remains in the structure of the hydrothermal vent. Most of it mixes with seawater and then precipitates, forming regions rich in metal concentration around the fissures. Most regions rich in metallic sulfides are composed of iron, which is not economically interesting. But take one of the samples found in the Manos Basin, one of the regions with the highest concentration of hydrothermal vents. It is rich in gold, with an estimated amount of 12.5 grams of gold per ton. And this places it in the category of high concentration ore. 
Considering that, in addition to gold, it is also rich in zinc and copper, the economic aspect of extracting these materials becomes more obvious. A recent article estimated that there are around 2.1 million kilograms of gold in these deposits. There's just one problem. For both polymetallic nodules and metallic sulfides, the zones of highest concentration are in international waters. And this raises the question, who should have control over these regions? When we talk about international waters, we are generally referring to the high seas, which is a well-defined concept in legal terms. The modern notion of the high seas began with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea of 1982. The text defines that countries have the right to economically exploit the oceans up to 370 kilometers from the coast. But beyond that, any claim of sovereignty is illegitimate. In practice, this means that if you are on the high seas, you have some extra freedoms, such as navigation, overflight, and scientific research, without needing to answer to anyone. If you are on board a ship and someone commits a crime, the criminal is judged based on the laws of the country in which the ship is registered. In other words, no one governs or owns the oceans. This leads to some problematic situations, such as fishing. Since no state has sovereignty over the oceans, unfortunately, it is quite common for fishing to occur without supervision or limits affecting the fish population. The impacts of fishing destabilize the ecosystem of nearby countries, which are often not the ones causing the problem. In addition to fishing, since the presence of mineral resources on the ocean floor was already known at the time, there also arose the need to regulate their exploitation to avoid future problems. That is why the same 1982 text establishes the creation of the ISA, which is the International Seabed Authority. Among some interesting passages are Article 136, which states that the resources contained in the oceans are the common heritage of all mankind, and Article 140, which states that ocean activities should be conducted for the benefit of humanity as a whole. The official responsibility of the International Seabed Authority, ISA, is to organize and control all activities involving the mineral resources of the oceans with the aim of benefiting humanity as a whole. And it was with this in mind that various regions of the ocean were divided and exploration contracts were signed. The clarion clipperton zone, for example, has been subdivided and currently has 17 active exploration contracts for polymetallic nodules. And in total, worldwide, there are 31 active contracts for the exploration of marine resources. But even with all the preparations and seemingly resolved legal issues, large-scale mining has still not begun. Why? A significant part of the answer is that there are still many uncertainties about how exactly the process will work. Interest in the mineral resources of the ocean floor has remained subdued for a long time, largely due to the extreme conditions associated with the environments in which they are found. I am always impressed when I remember that we know more about space than about the ocean floor here on Earth, and the reason is quite simple. Most of the deposits of polymetallic nodules, for example, are found between 4,000 and 6,000 meters deep. And this is deeper than the depth where the Titanic wreck is located, which to this day has been seen in person by fewer than 250 people. And a mining operation, as you can imagine, will require a lot of heavy machinery, infrastructure, and people working. The average pressure that the machines will face in the depths while removing polymetallic nodules is about 500 times the atmospheric pressure here at sea level, in addition to total darkness. To operate under these seemingly impossible conditions, the machines and infrastructure need to be specially designed and tested. That is why, for a long time, the idea of extracting minerals from the ocean floor remained on the sidelines. Many people simply did not believe that this would ever be possible. But technology has advanced, and today experts not only agree that it is possible, but they are actively working to make it a reality. Each company with an active contract develops its own technologies and solutions, but generally speaking, seabed mining occurs in four stages. The first stage is the mining of resources, which can be carried out by remotely operated robots. Since the ore layers are usually very thin, they closely resemble vacuum cleaners. Then comes the second stage, which consists of bringing the mined resources to the surface where a ship is waiting. The most practical solution is to use a kind of elevator that connects the robot on the seabed with a ship on the surface using fields. With the minerals already on board the ship, the third stage begins in which the first separation between what is sediment and what is mineral takes place. Finally, the fourth and last stage consists of transporting the resources by ship to a land-based facility for the final processing of the minerals, which can then be commercially traded as usual. In some tests conducted a few years ago, robot prototypes managed to extract tons of polymetallic nodules in a few hours, proving that this method allows us to extract these resources. But there is another part that I have left out until now and that you might already be wondering about. Traditional land-based mining leaves marks and scars on the world. Environmental impacts, even when the entire process is carried out with great care, are impossible to avoid. In the case of ocean floor mining, what kind of significant and extensive impacts can we expect? The truth is that no one knows what the true environmental cost of deep-sea mining would be. We don't know much about the seafloor, to be honest. The only certainty is that it wouldn't be good at all. 
When the International Seabed Authority was created in 1982, we still had no idea of the amount of life that existed on the ocean floor. Both the creation of the International Seabed Authority and the regulations involving the extraction of mineral resources from the seabed did not take into account the presence of entire ecosystems in these environments. As far as was known, they were barren and lifeless. We now suspect that life on Earth itself originated in the environment around hydrothermal vents. And with each research expedition conducted in these environments, we discover more new forms of life. Many of the life forms we find at these depths live for a long time and grow very slowly. And this makes them especially sensitive to variations in the surrounding environment, which remain unchanged over long periods of time. The most frightening thing is that we still do not fully understand the role of these ecosystems in the broader context of life in the oceans and even on Earth. In other words, we are not sure what might happen if these ecosystems disappear. One of the most likely ways for deep sea mining to destabilize these ecosystems is through sediment plumes. As mining occurs, the sand and sediments that were settled on the seabed are lifted and dispersed in the water. Some studies warn that these sediment plumes can spread for kilometers around the mined area, impacting and destabilizing even organisms far from the main zone. Another impact is related to the removal of the nodules themselves, which serve as a substrate, a kind of ground, for some forms of life to attach and thrive. It is not at all clear what the impact of removing polymetallic nodules would be on the formation and maintenance of biodiversity on the ocean floor. But the people who are currently in decision-making positions know all of this. So why should we mine the seabed? Most of the appeal comes from the presence of resources that today make up the technological world, with a special focus on metals used in batteries such as zinc, cobalt and lithium. That is why, most of the time, deep-sea mining is pointed out as a solution for the growth of the electric vehicle market, which requires batteries to operate. Currently, worldwide, one in every five cars sold is electric. And as humanity's current focus is on reducing carbon emissions, electric vehicles are a very real necessity. And the metals I just mentioned, which we need to build these cars, are at risk of having their availability affected by the ever-growing demand. But do we really need to risk destabilizing such sensitive ecosystems about which we understand so little, like those of the deep sea. To reduce our carbon emissions? According to a European Union report, the answer is no. The battery industry, for example, is constantly developing solutions to use more abundant metals, which can reduce our dependence on more expensive resources found on the seabed, such as cobalt and lithium. And they go further to assert that sustainable development should prioritize reducing humanity's need for resources that are already far beyond the point where their extraction is sustainable. In other words, we should focus more on making better use of what we have already extracted through the recycling of batteries and electronic waste, rather than relying on the extraction of new natural resources. Up to 95% of the materials that make up a battery can be recycled, and this includes cobalt and lithium, which are two of the most important metals in today's batteries. It is much easier for us to move towards circularity by recycling resources we already have to build new products, rather than continuing on the path we are on today, where we almost entirely depend on the extraction of new resources that have all the associated environmental and social impacts. The major concern today is that the International Seabed Authority continues to issue seabed exploration rights, and even though the organization is based on the protection of the marine environment, we do not yet truly understand the impact our actions can generate. In the end, the problem we are dealing with goes far beyond the extraction of resources from the oceans. And it is a kind of paradox that appears whenever we try to move towards a greener and more sustainable future. And the paradox is that to build the technologies we will need to reduce carbon emissions, we will require resources that have impacts on nature. And this might even seem like an excuse for us to close our eyes and allow ecosystems to be impacted, but quite the opposite. What today seems to be an obvious solution, like extracting resources waiting beneath the oceans for ages, is actually not quite like that. Before doing what we have been doing since the emergence of our species, which is extracting the resources around us without worrying about the impact it will have on the planet, we need to make better use of what we already have. Reduce our dependence on new resources. Build batteries that are easier to recycle. Make our products, especially electronics, last longer. And only then, if it is still necessary, can we talk about the real need to touch environments untouched for millions of years, guarded by columns of water kilometers deep in total darkness, but this time needing to extract and destroy as little as possible? Because we are truly concerned about what we are doing. After watching this video, what is your opinion on deep sea mining? I would love to know. Type here in the comments.
And if possible, send this video to someone to spread the message. Thank you very much and see you next time.